Welcome back to another Bellator fight prediction video. In this video, I'll be predicting the main card fights for Bellator 213, McFarlane versus Letourneau. So without further ado, let's get to our first fight on the main card. So in our first fight on the main card, we have in the light heavyweight division, Muhammad Lawal versus Liam McGreary. So King Mo versus Liam McGreary. Well, a former Bellator champion and what King Mo was like a former several time Bellator title contender, a tournament winner and stuff like that. But close enough, he had a belt, he always wore the crown, so he's always a champion in his mind and in his heart. So champion versus champion, or former champion versus former champion versus always in his mind and in his heart, the people's champion versus former champion, whatever case you want to say. So King Mo versus Liam McGreary. So looking at Liam McGreary, he's really never fared too well against wrestlers or people that can wrestle him. Phil Davis, first off, kind of did it to him. Well, Tito Ortiz did it to him as well. But he submitted Tito Ortiz in like kind of a weird submission submission hold. There's some other guy to wrestle him, I forgot. But he submitted him as well. But pretty much doesn't do too well against wrestlers. Somebody like, what was he had like three losses against wrestlers, wrestlers or grapplers, but definitely against wrestlers and grapplers. His takedown defense is really nothing to be proud of. He does have a long legs and can link up like lock up submissions. But that's about it as far as his defense for wrestlers. Then on the feet, he kind of has that those big long um, mosquito legs. And then he has like, good power in his fist. So he's a very awkward built dude with a very awkward style, but it's been getting exposed over these last couple of fights. He got submitted, he got decision. I think we got, we got TKO do the leg kicks and stuff. So, um, hasn't been doing too well. I think it's Muhammad Lawal, Kimo. I think Kimo definitely had the wrestling to take him down. I only kind of worry about Kimo is he tries to strike with him too much and thinks he's such a striker and gets caught. Or if Kimo, I don't know, gets, you know, gets tired because it seems like he's definitely one of the better wrestlers in the sport, but like his cardio doesn't really keep up with his wrestling. Like he's been getting tired, he's been fatigued, he'd be all sweating and be exhausted. And maybe that leaves him open to get a submission, submitted. But Kimo has never been submitted in his career and he's been in the guards of some solid fighter like Gegar Masasi, maybe some other guy I can think of. He didn't knock out that Gracie, but that wasn't really too much in the guy's guard. He just knocked him out on the feet. Whatever the case is. I think Kimo has done pretty well as far as submission defense. I think he's very submission savvy as far as defending submissions. Maybe not as locking them up, but at least defending them. And let's not leave him a grill. He's no black belt. He's just a long person with long legs that knows how to tie them together. Like he knows how to tie shoes. Whatever the case, that's who Liam McGurry is. But as far as fight, I think the takedowns will, will be there. Liam McGurry will probably put more of a focus to defending them. Kimo will probably give him chances on the feet. But I don't think. Um, McGurry will be able to fully capitalize on those those attempts. I think Kimo has been with TKO maybe like once or twice in his career. So it's not like he's that susceptible to getting knocked out. He might get hit, he might get rocked, but he's always in there in most cases unless you're like really among the best or at doing it. Like I said, I think Kimo will be able to, the takedowns will be available. Kimo's will take them. This being a three round fight, he doesn't have to do this for five rounds. Maybe get two rounds of lay and pray. Some decent ground and pound. Just mix it up and just take advantage with the blueprint that's already there to beat McGurry. And I think he'll he'll be able to do at least do that and win a a decent comfortable enough decision. Probably be some scary moments in there just from it being King Mo who kind of like is sloppy at times. But the takedown is gonna be there, and he has the control to be able to control at least for two or three rounds to win a decision. So in this fight, I got Muhammad the De- Wall King Mo via decision. Now on to our next fight, we have in the welterweight division in this welterweight tournament, we got Neiman Gracie versus Ed Roof. So Neiman Gracie, top notch Brazilian Jiu Jitsu practitioner. Come from the family of jiu-jitsu practitioners, the family who created BJJ, at least the BJJ as we know it, they created it. And you got Ed Roof, Division One wrestler standout, wrestling standout, three-time NCAA champion. So you got two beasts right here. But when I look at this fight, like Neiman Gracie, if he goes to the ground, he can submit just about anybody, especially, I mean, like, I'm not saying especially Ed Roof, but he can submit Ed Roof for sure if he goes to the ground. That's definitely his territory, at least in this fight. And Ed Roof got to respect that. But looking at this fight, Ed Roof has a, come from a wrestling background. And usually, a top-notch wrestler decides whether the fight goes to the ground or not. They dictate where the, where it goes to the ground. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioners don't usually have the best takedown offense and stuff. They usually kind of have subpar takedowns, but all, whether they're on the back or on top of you, they're scary all the time. But like I said, Ed Roof will be dictating whether this fight goes to the ground because he's a wrestler. Yeah, Neiman Grace will be attacking. He has to worry about it. But like I said, I think Ed Roof has the key to whether it goes to the ground or stays up. And on the feet, Neiman Gracie's striking is really kind of awful and not, nothing really to talk about. He better get it to the ground because that's he desperate for that. But Ed Roof is coming real. Like, he knows he's coming to his own on the feet. I think he'll be able to defend the takedown, march Neiman Gracie down. And when you're going back, those takedowns aren't really as, as effective. So Ed Roof just walking him down. The takedowns all, like automatically going to lose a lot of effect, effectiveness for Gracie. That's going to give Ed Roof even more control of the takedown. And then he's going to be punt, like tagging him up and probably knocking him and Gracie out, in my opinion, as far as I see the fight. I think it's probably what happened about 
the second round, just kind of wear on him and not really allow Neiman Gracie to take the fight where he needs to take it to him, just hurt him, just hurt him bad and hurt him again and again to the ref has to stop it. So in this fight, I got Ed Roof via second round TKO. Now on to our co-main event. We have in the middleweight division, Lioto the Dragon Machida versus Rafael Carvalho. So looking at Rafael Carvalho, striker, that's what he is. He's a striker. I don't know about jiu-jitsu. Is that a phenomenal? Maybe he does have some jiu-jitsu, but I haven't really seen any things like spectacular about jiu-jitsu because Giga Masazi sure did take him down and like five seconds get his back and just pound him out. So your jiu-jitsu can't be that amazing. I know Giga Masazi is amazing, but he ain't that amazing. So your jiu-jitsu ain't all that. So more so, Caballo is a striker. He has okay wrestling defense. It's definitely not bad. It's definitely solid enough, but it's not great. Striking has some powerful kicks, has some powerful punches. But more so, I think his kicks are his most dangerous tools, like those body kicks, those switches to head kicks, and he's very long and rangy. But against Machida, I don't think, unless maybe he tacks the legs, I think those kicks kind of not really not going to be effective. I think he has to use his hands to counter Machida coming in. Other than that, I think Machida is still, even at this age, can dictate the range because Machida is so good at moving in and out. It's really the only time you really catch him is it, when he's coming in, if you could time it. I don't think Carvalho's timing is all that phenomenal, so I think Machida will be able to just come in and come out like he just like he needs to and wants to. And Machida also has some pretty good taking on offense as well, probably better than Masasi in my opinion. It's very sneaky. I mean, I may, maybe won't be as sneaky as, as it was in his prime, like in, you know, what was that, UFC 2, 3, when he had the unblockable take now. It ain't that no more, but I think he still holds up enough to take Carvalho down if he wants to go there. I think he'll be the better grappler on the ground. So I think Machida has all the tools to win this fight, however he wants to win it. I think it's probably more going to be a decision. I think he's going to come in and be smart. He knows that Carvalho's dangerous. He's going to point fight on the feet, mixing the takedowns, just, you know, just to keep Carvalho off his game enough so that Carvalho can never really land those big shots he needs to land to stop the fight. And Machida is definitely the better point fighter, obviously, between these two. So in this fight, I just think Leon Machida puts on a pretty clean performance, nothing super spectacular, but clean enough to win a clear three rounds and coast his way into maybe a title fight with Masasi or maybe some fight with somebody else, but whoever the case is, maybe Ryan Bader or Masasi, whoever he wants. Maybe he gets his way into one of those fights again. But So in this fight, Leona Machida via decision. Now on to our main event we have in the women's flyweight division, Alima Lay McFarlane versus Valerie Letourneau. So Letourneau basically is here because she got beat out of the UFC. First, she couldn't make weight. She's struggling to make weight. She, well, she got all the way to a title shot, then got dogged by Joanna, put on at least a, a decent performance in the loss. Then she got destroyed. Then she got pretty much pounded by an undersized fighter at a weight class Then I think. She left. Maybe she left before they created the 125 pound division. Where case she left because not because she was so good or she just decided, or oh, maybe it's better things elsewhere. She pretty much got beat out of the UFC and was almost contemplating retirement and was talking about weight and stuff. So she didn't leave dominantly. She left kind of on a losing end. But she's been looking okay in in um Bellator. So she hasn't fought really the best of competition, but she's looking been looking good. She still they got that striker and she still has that veteran experience, especially in the UFC that a lot of fighters won't have. But I guess Alima Lay, I think Alima Lay, I'm not going to say she's the better striker, but I think she can at least hold her own with, with um, Valerie Letourneau on his feet. She's a younger fighter. She's a faster fighter. And she has more more versatile. She has the submission ability that Letourneau really kind of lacks. Letourneau might be able to grapple, but Alima Lay's grappling is on a different level. Like I said, she's a younger fighter. She's a more faster fighter. It's been a five-round fight, and it's in her territories. It's in her league. It's in her um, home state. Hawaii, her home island, home turf. You're just walking into a bad area. I think this is going to be all set up for Lima Lay to put on you know, a good performance for her. Maybe even vouch for her to go to UFC one day just by showing how badly she could beat Laterno, how good of a performance she could put on. And the 125 division in the UFC is needing some new talent as far as the women's um, 125 division who really doesn't have anybody for um, Valentina Shevchenko to face outside of maybe like two people. So it's always looking for people to come in. Where are cases? Like I said, I think Lima Lay can... The simplest is I think Lima Lake could hold her own on feet with Laterno, but she's a younger, faster fighter, so she could push the pace, push it longer, and she could take it where she wants to take it, and she's going to have all the momentum on her side coming into the fight, and then through the fight, she'll have the momentum. Unless Valerie Laterno could find some way to shift it, which I don't think she will. I think Lima Lake just kind of dictates the pace the whole fight, mixes it in the grappling, and then she gets a second-round submission and takes her out of there. So in this fight, I got Lima Lake McFarland via second-round submission. And that concludes my five predictions for Bellator 213, McFarlane versus Letourneau. Thanks for watching. Like, comment, subscribe, and come back for more videos. Peace.